So my job is to talk a little bit about some of the issues of gender and myeloproliferative neoplasms, which is a great topic and one that's been of interest to many of us um, on the call here for a long time. So I first wanna talk a little bit about the fact that cancer is different in men and women, and that shouldn't be of surprise. It's not just the difference between the likelihood of um, certain cancers like, uh, for example, prostate cancer or breast cancer, ovarian cancer, of course, but overall males have a higher incidence of cancer. When we look at the um, diseases like the chronic myeloid diseases, and that includes myeloproliferative neoplasms, but it also includes diseases like myelodysplastic syndrome, or a cancer like chronic myelogenous leukemia, males also have a higher incidence of that. Um, when we look, here's just in 2020, looking at all of leukemia, and we see that the new cases of leukemia in 2020, and that includes chronic leukemias, as well as things like myelodysplastic syndrome or acute leukemias, even acute lymphoblastic leukemias. This is the total number of new cases this is the cases in men, and this is the cases in females. And then deaths are also distributed in that distribution. There was a recent paper actually out on looking at MDS-MPN overlap syndromes, which is a sort of more aggressive form of myeloproliferative neoplasm, not like ET, PV, or MF, but a little bit more aggressive, and males tend to have a worse overall outcome and with a higher chance in these syndromes of becoming acute leukemia. In addition, people have different responses to treatments sometimes. So what about in MPNs, the classical MPNs that we talk about here with polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, or myelofibrosis? Well, over time, research led, for example, by Dr. Moliterno that Anne mentioned earlier, has shown that there are some differences in the way women and men go through and have the diseases of MPNs. There tends to be a little bit different age at acquisition. There is a different natural history, meaning some people are more aggressive versus some people are, have less aggressive disease, and that tends to differ based on gender, at least when you look at large numbers of patients. There is a different kind of symptoms that are experienced there's a different chance of blood clots in different parts of the body. And finally, the chances of clonal expansion, meaning the disease becoming more complex or having a larger burden of disease also may differ between men and women. So let's look a little bit about the total number of people diagnosed. Well, if you, this is sort of a complicated slide, but looking at all MPNs, more women are diagnosed with MPNs in their ages of 30 to 50, and more men are diagnosed over the age of 50. And if you just look at essential thrombocythemia, you can see that that's more common in women, no matter what the age is. So over time, you can see that the likelihood of diagnosis changes based a little bit on gender. And this may be associated just with a person's exposure to the healthcare syndrome system. During the ages of 20 to 50, women are more likely to be have, for example, their CBC checked. They may be more likely to see a primary care doctor. And that's because of, that's because, I'm sorry, I keep getting page. That's because of the likelihood of fertility or seeing a PCP during that time. So younger patients with PV, those are more likely to be female. Pediatric ET and pediatric PV, more likely to be female. And JAK2 mutated essential thrombocythemia is also more likely to be female. So we can see a little bit how age and gender interact with diagnoses. We also know, as I mentioned, that the natural history of the disease is different between the genders. Females are more likely to present with splenomegaly. They're more likely to have what we call mast erythrocytosis, meaning that their bone marrow is actually making too many red cells and has the characteristics of polycythemia vera. But when you look at their peripheral blood, the numbers look relatively normal or within the normal line. 
range. That's called mast erythrocytosis, and that's more likely in females. And finally, females are more likely to present with hepatic vein thromboses, which is a blockage here above the liver. And you can tell if this vein here, this top vein was blocked, you might get congestion in the liver and, and actually problems with liver function. And that condition is more prevalent in women than men. In fact, blood clots in the abdomen overall are more common in women than men. We also know because of work led by Dr. Messa and some of his mentees that women are more likely to have different kinds of, uh, different kinds of symptoms. Um, for example, we use a, something called the NPM SAF, a symptom assessment form and a fatigue inventory routinely with patients that come in with new diagnoses or over the course of their disease. Dr. Geyer went through about more than 2000 patients who filled out these forms. She and others hypothesized that gender changed the way symptoms were experienced and that panned out in the research that they did. Sorry. For example, women were more likely to experience fatigue, abdominal pain and abdominal discomfort, which we know is maybe in some cases related to either large or even small clots or sludging in the abdominal cavity, in the abdominal vasculature. Headaches, dizziness, numbness, and insomnia, all were more significantly more present in women than in men. So what are the take-home points of the overall difference between men, women and men at the time of diagnosis? Women tend to be younger. Essential thrombocythemia is more common than polycythemia vera in women. They may develop worse symptoms or at least in some categories of symptoms may have worse symptoms. And there may be a higher incidence of vascular complications. Now men may have more aggressive disease over time, which leads to worse survival and there may be a higher likelihood of transformation to myelofibrosis. I wanna emphasize before you think that this is prophecy here, that these are really just likelihoods, meaning that any man or woman can, be, can be, have characteristics that may be more common with the other genders. So likelihoods are just looking at prior data and extrapolating to the future. It doesn't, guarantee what's happening in your life. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right, so of course I keep losing this. So I want to next move into some common questions that occur in female patients. And hopefully this can be of some help. So one of the main questions I get, especially with younger women, women in their fertile years, is whether or not it's possible to use oral contraceptive for um, oral contraceptives, either uh, combined estrogen, uh, progesterone pills, or progesterone alone. So essential thrombocythemia, as I mentioned before, is the most common myeloproliferative disease in fertile women. And this has been known for a long time. And those are the women where we really want to make sure that they uh, have control over their reproduction, in particular because there are some complications to pregnancy associated with ET. And so oral contraceptive is a helpful and effective form of birth control. Unfortunately, oral contraceptive, including if it includes estrogen, is hypercoagulable. And what that means is even in people without other risk factors for blood clots in the veins of the lungs or the veins of the legs or abdomen, have an increased risk of clotting when they're on estrogen containing oral contraceptive. So you can imagine patients with ET who have a risk for clotting and are on oral contraceptives in sort of amplify their hypercoagulable state. Now we also know that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Thrombosis is the number one cause of maternal death overall. But I really do think when I'm talking to patients that it's important to illustrate why, in my opinion, oral contraceptive is not recommended. 
We do have some studies on this. One is a relatively older study led by physicians at the Mayo Clinic in the early 2000s. And that looked at contraceptives and they looked at combination hormones, meaning estrogen plus progesterone contraceptive versus patients on progesterone only oral contraceptives, which is called the mini pill or can be sometimes depo provera. So they showed that the general population has a three to six fold increased risk of venous thrombosis if they're on oral contraceptive. And a retrospective study of more than 300 patients, including of ET patients, there was a subset of patients of ET who were on oral contraceptives. And those that were on oral contraceptives and had ET had a 23% chance of a blood clot whereas those with ET without oral contraceptives had a 7% chance of a blood clot. Now that shows me that the combination certainly amplifies the risk. And when I discuss this with patients, I recommend against combination therapy. I recommend for, for example, IUDs, uh, barrier contraception like, the, uh, like condoms, or if a patient is really good at taking pills, progesterone-only contraceptives, the key with progesterone-only contraceptives is that they need to be taken at about the same time every single day. Their margin of error for allowing breakthrough ovulation is much uh, easier. And so those progesterone-only contraceptives don't, are not as effective at, presenting, at preventing pregnancy because they are a little, they're harder to take than oral contraceptives. Um, again, this is a conversation I have with patients and one that I, if you're interested in um, talking with your um, hematologist about it, you can also uh, ask if there's any kind of specialist in the OB-GYN department, because many orth, uh, gynecologists are very comfortable discussing oral contraceptives in patients who have a baseline clotting risk, which is patients with MPNs, but also other systemic conditions that can increase the risk of clotting. So another question that comes up is, can I carry a successful pregnancy? So pregnancy may be difficult for patients with MPN for a couple of reasons. First, you have to recognize that the real health of the baby depends on a very healthy flow of blood between the mother and the fetus via the umbilical cord and via the placenta. So blood clots, either large or small in the placenta, in the umbilical cord, can sometimes lead to difficulties for the fetus. In addition, clotting has always been a problem during pregnancy because it increases your likelihood of systemic clots in the lungs or the legs, both before and after pregnancy. And finally, bleeding can be a problem with pregnancy. After the delivery, um, the, the placenta is also delivered, and that can be a time of maternal danger if bleeding risk is not addressed. So for all those reasons, there's long been a concern about patients with MPNs and whether or not pregnancy is safe. So we do know, based on a recent study, that there are some concerns with essential thrombocythemia, in fact, with all MPNs. There is a 3.5% incidence of maternal clotting. Now that's slightly above baseline, uh, the clotting events above baseline. There's a incidence of major bleeding and preeclampsia. And there's about, at least in this one study, about a 28% incidence of miscarriage or actually included in this was both therapeutic and uh, um, elective abortion. So this doesn't necessarily mean it was due to the ET. There's a 4% uh, incidence of growth retardation, which just means that the fetus might be slightly smaller than base than normal fetuses at the time. And there's an 8% incidence of preterm delivery. So that's just a recent, again, retrospective study of patients with ET and outcomes. Again, I wanna emphasize that this is not a prophecy. This is just a look back at patients who were under the care of doctors and had ET and were pregnant. There was a meta-analysis performed in 2019 
that looked at a large number of pregnancies in patients with MPNs. And they showed that there's a live birth rate of about 71%. The general population has a live birth rate of about 80%. So this is slightly below the general population. Successful pregnancies were slightly more common in ET than polycythemia vera. And aspirin or interferon during pregnancy was as associated with more successful pregnancy, which we don't really know the reason for that. And at this time, patients who are not already on interferon, for example, aren't started on it, but it just might speak to the fact that those patients were under a little bit um, more aggressive care during their pregnancy. Maternal adverse events were uncommon. So how do we think about pregnancy in patients with MPNs? Well, the first thing is in my younger patients, I always talk about preconception counseling. So let's talk about your risks and how we're gonna plan this in advance. We go over whether or not they've already had a prior clot, either in their veins or their arteries, if they've had bleeding or pregnancy complications. Do they have other things that are gonna make pregnancy difficult like uh, diabetes or hypertension? And what are their platelet counts? So I go through that and I work with a specialist at MCW, for example, who's a hematologist, but particularly interested in pregnancy. And she and I come up with a preconception plan, including involving sometimes our gynecologists or obstetricians to make sure that everyone's on the same page before conception is planned. We take a multidisciplinary approach. We discuss discontinuing um, medications that might be dangerous to the fetus. We talk about when or when it's appropriate to start aspirin or low molecular weight heparin. We talk about both what are we gonna do at delivery and postpartum, and we provide breastfeeding information. Now in low risk patients, we generally continue a low dose aspirin if it had been on before. We monitor the platelet count. We can consider phlebotomies if necessary. Although really during pregnancy, people's blood counts drop because the body is, has to compensate for an additional volume where those cells need to go. So there's sort of an increased plasma volume of pregnancy. In high risk patients, I like to taper people off of hydrea or nagrolide uh, significantly before conception. Hydrea isn't 100% contraindicated and it doesn't mean that you need to um, consider it dangerous if one got pregnant on hydrea but anagrolide crosses the placenta and cytoreduction agents like interferon are likely safe. We wanna in particular pay attention to our clotting risk and sometimes even use prophylactic level low molecular weight heparin in some patients. Now, let's talk about as you get older and how we need to keep ourselves healthy as we age. This is a common question that also I get, especially because people are typically diagnosed in their later ages. So we know that menopause has changes in women with or without myeloproliferative neoplasms. And those changes begin in your later reproductive years and then trans change a little bit as you get into perimenopause and finally into menopause. The main things people notice in their later reproductive years are shortening cycles and difficulty with infertility. This is sometimes times when we have to discuss the risk benefit of infertility, uh, for example, um, infertility procedures with patients. And that is a difficult conversation and really revolves around the plus minuses of going through this because of some of the medications that are used during fertility planning um, may also increase the risk of clotting. So that's a, a difficult conversation that that you really wanna go through risks and benefits with patients. But people, even if you're not looking to get pregnant during your later reproductive years, you'll notice that the cycles can sometimes get initially shorter and then longer, meaning skip cycles. And that's because it's the early part of the cycle that shortens first. So people can have very irregular cycles during their reproductive years and difficulty understanding when ovulation might be occurring. During perimenopause, vasomotor symptoms are common, and those symptoms tend to worsen 
as perimenopause goes on. When I talk about vasomoto symptoms, I'm talking really about hot flashes or hot flushes as they're sometimes caused, uh, called. Now, this does not happen in everybody. Many people go through menopause without ever having hot flashes. This is likely mediated by other factors of the other of the body that can change or influence menopausal symptoms. Once you hit menopause, meaning you no longer menstruate, vasomotor symptoms continue for some months to sometimes even years, depending again on the patient. After menopause, so 10, five, 10 years after menopause, women can experience urogenital atrophy, which is a fancy word for difficulty with intercourse or vaginal dryness. So some of the things that are very common, as I said, are hot flashes. These are different than night sweats. Night sweats tend to be more prolonged, are often asymptomatic, and don't are necessarily accompanied by this rising sense of hotness over the body followed by um, a rapid heartbeat and sometimes sweats. Hot flashes are influenced most by your genes. And uh, so people with family history of severe hot flashes may have hot flashes themselves. Obesity, smoking, mid, uh, exercise, uh, lack of exercise can all also make hot flashes work worse. And I would argue that those are three things that are under our control and things that you need. You can mitigate hot flashes by working on your weight, increasing your exercise, in particular, weightlifting exercises, which increases your resting metabolism, may help hot flashes. Depression, so depressive symptoms also tend to increase after menopause. These are amenable to therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and antidepressants and something to keep an eye on. Suicide doesn't tend to accompany as much in women at this age, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen. So keeping an eye on this, and many people enter therapy in their later years with great success. So depression is most effectively treated with both talk therapy of some kind, plus an antidepressant for severe symptoms. And some antidepressants are also helped are also help hot flashes and sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance is a common feature of menopause. It can sometimes be a difficulty following a, falling asleep, but it's more often a, diff a difficulty with early morning wake up or a lack of deep sleep in the second half of the night. So it's important to understand what's treatable. Um, sleep disturbance can be managed with sleep hygiene meaning regular bedtime, regular wake up time, limiting screens so that you're not looking at either your computer, your iPad or your phone for an hour or two before you go to bed, making sure that the only thing you do in your bedroom is sleep and have sex. You don't wanna be working in your bed. You don't wanna be fighting in your bedroom. You don't wanna be eating in your bedroom. Those kind of things can interrupt your sleep hygiene and make it less likely that you fall asleep. You should make sure you don't have anything else that's getting in the way of your sleep. For example, sleep apnea, things that, um, things that might uh, pain, or for example, hot flashes. So if those are getting in the way of your sleep, you should um, see if you can mitigate those. And also recognize that sleep disturbance is a common feature, even people without MPNs. And it's just a feature of getting old. So be kind to yourself, don't beat yourself up if you can't sleep, don't think it's your fault or get angry. Recognize that there has long been a history of what's called second sleep, people who wake up in the middle of the night and then go back to sleep after they've gone out and read or uh, sat in a chair and meditated, for example. And sometimes people find that second sleep to be very relaxing. The last issue is vaginal dryness or changes to uh, sexual function. This tends to happen even later after menopause. It doesn't happen right away. But you can discuss local estrogen therapy with your hematologist. Depending on your risk for blood clots, some people find local he uh, estrogen therapy, meaning either cream, uh, suppositories, or even an estrogen-eluting ring can be safe enough. 
um, without increasing clotting risk. And that's again, a risk benefit to talk with your doctor. Now, the other major change that happens after menopause is an increased cardiovascular risk. And this is something that should be addressed uh, with all patients with MPNs because cardiovascular risks, arterial clots, blood clots to the heart um, or to the brain are an important risk in MPNs like ET and PV and need to be managed. So this is taking our lady that I had the picture of before. She's a 62 year old female, she's African-American. Her total cholesterol is, 2000, is 202 with an HDL of 45. Her blood pressure is usually a little higher when she comes to see me with a systolic of 145 over a diastolic of 90. And she's never been on medicine. She's like, I don't want to use medicine. I want to exercise more. She has no diabetes and she's not smoking. So we used a calculator from the American Heart Association and we calculated that even without PV or, M or ET, she has ET. She has a 9.4% risk of heart disease or stroke in the next 10 years. And again, this AHA calculator is free to everybody. You can just go on the on the website and she is not she does not need to start aspirin for her just for her heart disease but she's on an aspirin because of her essential thrombocythemia but on the basis of her risk she needs to be on a statin and she also needs better blood blood pressure control so that's what we use to talk about this and why i discussed that i felt that being on a statin and a, and a anti-hypertensive medicine was the right thing for her to try and get this 9.4% down. It is really important to have impeccable cardiovascular risk factor control when you have an MPN, because that's one of the places where mortality can be most affected. And this can be under our control. So what are your targets? A complete abstinence from smoking, heart healthy eating patterns. So you wanna really focus on fruits, grains, uh, vegetables, low fat dairy, et cetera. And you wanna keep your body mass index in a, good in a good range. Again, the American Heart Association has a calculator that you can put in your, your current height and your weight, and then it'll calculate your BMI. And your BMI can be in this range. So here's the BMI of everybody before the pandemic, and here's the BMI of everybody after the pandemic. And you want to try and aim to be closer in what we call the healthy weight, which is tough, but it's there. Now, a healthy weight is not necessarily just on the basis of diet. Exercise matters as well, and I'm going to talk about that. Here are some metrics for your cholesterol. Your total cholesterol is calculated by your HDL plus your LDL plus your triglycerides. HDL is traditionally called the good cholesterol, and we want that to be high. And that's what goes down after you go through menopause. Your LDL is your bad cholesterol, so you want that to be lower. And the targets are complicated, so you want to talk about that with your doctor, and you want to discuss how frequently you should be tested with your primary care doctor. There are different interventions you can use, but diet and exercise are always helpful. Um, and so you wanna really think about what kind of exercise can you build into your life? Aerobic exercise lowers cholesterol and blood pressure, increases your endurance, and it helps with weight loss and, men's, and maintenance. And aerobic exercise can include things like bicycling, weightlifting, yoga, walking or running, and then things like gardening and dancing count everything. And then also do little things that help you. Park a little bit farther from the grocery store, walk the steps instead of taking an elevator, build up slowly, but make exercise a part of your life. That's going to be good for a lot of symptoms postmenopausal and likely symptoms related to your MPN. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is that for every patient, the risk for other cancers, pancreatic cancer, skin cancers, uh, ovarian cancers, those go up over time. Those are related to age. Now, there's also a slightly increased risk for patients that have myeloproliferative neoplasms to get other cancers. In an Italian study, 
There's an increased risk of lymphoma type diseases. A Danish study showed an increased risk of solid tumor, again, slightly higher. A Swedish study showed an increase of certain thyroid cancers, and there is increase of solid tumor. So you also want to make sure as you get into your older years that you're keeping your preventative health. No tobacco, good sun protection, limit your alcohol, and watch your weight. Those are good overall ways to prevent cancer development in your older years. You also want to make sure you're getting your mammogram, your colonoscopies, your pap smears, including testing for high-risk high viruses, prostate exams if you're a male. And if you've been a smoker, discuss with your primary care doctor whether or not you need a low-dose CT scan. Now, finally, most human problems are, are really related to a lack of communication, and that includes health. So make sure that you're allowing your different doctors to talk to one another. And you can facilitate that. Keep your own records to bring them back and forth. Make sure that they are sharing your electronic or medical record back and forth. Work with the ancillary staff. Make sure you keep track of what's important to you and share that with the doctors who might know more about your heart or might know more about your hormones or might know more about your pregnancies. And share, that, share your emails and your phone numbers with your hematologist. Make sure they are talking to one another. If you're going to have surgery or you're going to have your cataracts done or you're going to have, um, if you're going to have a baby, make sure your doctors are talking to one another. And you can't really be too squeaky about that because communication between your providers is critical to keeping you safe. So in conclusion, I want you to control what you can. I also think it's very important to acknowledge that we are not perfect. And we are not going to stay perfect as we age, like it has in this cartoon, which is one of my favorites. We are only flesh and blood and collagen. At the end of the day, we are just bodies and we have to take care of that body, but that body cannot be perfect. I want you to ask questions and get involved. I want you to encourage clinical participation in clinical trials among you and your, the people that you talk to. And also, if you're not seeing the clinical trials you want done, Talk to your doctors about them. And finally, focus on being a person, not a patient, because that's really the, the trick here is focusing on what's good. I'm going to thank you for listening now. I'm happy to answer any questions that arise. And I'm, of course, very grateful for support from Anne and uh, the MPN Education and Advocacy International, as well as the MPN Research Foundation. So thank you so much.